My name is Rachel Jackson. Um, I presented this talk originally at IXDA 16 in Helsinki. How many of you got a chance to be there? It's good. <laughs> so Alexis very kindly invited me to do the talk that I did there, here for you today. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here and I got the chance to spend the weekend in Munich. It's a really beautiful city, so lovely to be here. So my talk um, is about how I became a manager of the UX and design team. So my kind of journey to get to that point came a little bit unexpectedly, um, and I found it both challenging and rewarding. So my talk today is to um, tell you about that experience and um, help you understand kind of what I went through, and hopefully my experience will help you in uh, whether you want to be a manager or whether you don't. Um, the lessons that I learned, I think, are pretty universal. So don't just apply to being a manager, but that is kind of what the talk is based on. So before I start, I just want to give you a little bit of background about my story and how I got to be in the position I am. Um, so I consider it to be a slightly unusual journey, although I think probably a lot of us in UX had a bit of an unusual journey to get to where we are. Um, I had worked previously as a product manager at Microsoft um, and what I realized doing that role was that the best parts of my job, the most interesting parts, was when I got to do UX and work on the design of the product. So I decided to kind of try to shift and move into that area. So in September 2010 I joined Thomson Reuters where I've now been for almost six years and I joined the team as a junior interaction designer. So I was kind of pretty early on in my journey, learning the basics of UX and trying to improve my skills and the practice. And then um, a couple years on, a little bit less than two years, our head of visual design left. So that was in June 2012. And my manager at the time asked me if I wanted to take over the role of head of visual design. And I thought this was a little bit crazy. I had no experience um, in visual design, I had no formal education in design, um, and I didn't know how to use Photoshop. Um, but nevertheless, I thought about it for a few days, maybe a little bit more, got some advice, and in the end I couldn't turn it down. So I, I became head of visual design at that time after kind of only a brief period as an interaction designer. So I was pretty much in at the deep end. I was very much out of my depth. I didn't really know exactly what I was doing or how I was meant to do it, and, and I found it quite difficult. So um, it was a struggle. And if I think back to um, what I thought it would be like and what it has actually been like, I, I think it's quite interesting. You know, I had certain expectations and certain preconceptions of what it meant to be a manager of a UX and design team. And I feel like I learned a lot also kind of through that process um, and uh, that's what I want to share with you today, kind of some of the things that I learned going through that transition and what would have helped me if I'd known when I started. So this is me today, um, well the picture is a couple years old but you get the idea. Uh, my title is Director of Design, I work for Thomson Reuters in the Financial and Risk Division. So it's a very large company, um, we have 60,000 people worldwide, we have uh, a number of different divisions and um, my focus has been on Icon. So this is the name of the product. We have a fairly large in-house UX team. Um, Icon is very feature rich, very complex software. Uh, we also have a web version, we have a mobile app um, and we have about 130,000 users uh, financial professionals globally. So this is, you know, very complex um, data. We have news, analytics, trading tools, messaging services. It's a very complex software, um, and, and this is what we work on day to day. So what I really like about working there is that you always have interesting problems to solve. So you're never doing the same thing, you know, two days in a row. There's always something new. You can't find the design pattern or example of where it's been done before um, because there is no, nothing else like it out there. So there's always very unique problems to solve and I work with a great team um, and that's part of kind of why I like it so much. 
So, you know, it's in the time that I was, I've always worked on Icon, but I've had different teams. So, you know, starting as head of visual design and then moving on to manage both visual designers and interaction designers, um, which is what I do now. So my particular story and my context is working within quite a large corporation. Um, the challenges there are different than working at a smaller company or at an agency. Uh, so that is kind of where I'm coming from, but I do think the lessons are kind of universal. So the uh, ISDA 16 conference had a theme called The Future, and we heard a lot of interesting talks thinking about the future of design. Um, there were talks about virtual reality, artificial intelligence, machine learning, voice recognition, all, kind of all the, all the big things that were coming up in the world. So it was a really great experience, great to kind of hear what's going on outside of my world where I've been very much focused on financial markets for the last six years. Um, but my talk had a slightly different tact. So I wasn't really thinking about any of the new kind of technical trends. I was thinking at a more personal level, so what is your future, or my future, or any of our futures? So I just want to pause here for a moment, find out a little bit about you, the audience, um, and see, you know, of the people here, how many of you are already a manager of the UX design team? Um, are, is there any of you considering becoming a manager at some point in your careers? A few again. <laughs> um, are there some of you who know you definitely don't want to be a manager? A couple. <laughs> Small number. And quite a few people who have abstained, so don't really have an opinion. <laughs> um, okay, that, that's interesting. When I did my talk at, at ISDA, I was surprised that probably the majority of the room were people who were managers. Um, so I guess it was something, the talk and, and the intro about it kind of appealed to people for that reason. Um, so, so my talk is, yes, about our futures. And one path is to be a manager. Of course, it's not the only path, and it's not the best path or the right path. Everybody is individual, and so what's right for you is also very individual. So, this is, again, about my experience running a design team and the things that I learned. And the way I've structured my talk is to break it down into the three big lessons that I learned. Um, but what it is not is a checklist of things to do, and it, it doesn't cover everything you need to know to be a manager. That's a huge list, and I couldn't do it justice in an hour or less. <laughs> um, and even the things that I do talk about is mainly based on my experience. I've tried uh, to kind of ground it in the things that I've read, so research um, that's been done, books, articles, you know, some of the latest thinking about leadership and about um, management. But at the same time, you know, what worked for me and my experience may not work for you. But hopefully there'll be a few things in there that you'll find interesting. So my big, three big lessons, um, and these are, I'll go into each one now, are how I was able to apply my UX skills to management and leadership. Secondly, what really matters in leadership, which wasn't what I thought when I started. Um, and lastly, how to give myself a break. So my first lesson, um, this came fairly early on in, in my journey when I was working as head of visual design when I kind of had a bit of a breakthrough and I realized, although I felt very much out of my depth, I realized actually I had quite a few skills um, and knew, had some really good grounding and basics from working in user experience that I could now apply to being a manager. So these are some of the skills, this is just a handful of course, we all have more skills than this, but, but some of them that I thought were really important. Um, and that, that helped me. So, you know, we've all got these skills from working in UX. We know the importance of communication, of empathy, of learning to design. And what I realized was I needed to take those skills and just apply it to a new context. So I also thought about the principles of user experience um, and how those apply to management. So in design, 
understanding the users is key. We all know that in order to design something for someone, you have to know who they are, you have to know what are their goals, what are their objectives, um, and find the right solution for them. So I believe this equally applies to understanding the people around you. So as a manager and a leader, now your users are your team and your manager and the stakeholders that you work with. So this was you know, quite an important realization for me. Um, being you know, previously working as a sole practitioner, I would very much focus on the product and on the details of what I was working on and get you know, really into a, an interaction and the naming of a label. Um, but you need to pay, what I realized is you need to pay that kind of detailed attention to the people that you work with and the people around you. So what I mean by that, um, understanding your team, so not just kind of at a surface level, but really deeply, you know, what is motivating them? Why are they coming into work each day? What is important to them? And, you know, at, at one level, this helps you just if you know strengths and weaknesses, so you know who to assign work to. Um, but, but more than that, everybody is different. So some people need different things from you, so you kind of have to adapt your style to be the best manager to them. So some people maybe want more information, and some people want more guidance, other people prefer less and want to be a little bit more free. But I think, you know, once you really understand what's important to them, what's driving them, what are their goals, that's when you can do your best work to support them. Because it's a very uh, a process that you depend on them as much as they depend on you. So in order to achieve your goals as a manager, you need your people to also be supporting you. And they will only do that if they feel that you've got their backs as well. So similarly, I think this applies to your manager. And I think you have kind of as much responsibility to your manager as you do to your team. Um, and of course, whether or not you're a manager, we've all had managers, we know what that's like. Um, but I think that the relationship changes. So when you're a manager, you probably are going to get less direction, probably a little bit less time from your manager. Um, that's because they've, you're now higher up, they've got more responsibility, so probably a little bit less time for you. So at this point, it's really about kind of figuring out on your own what you need to do, where you can add the most value, what projects and, and areas to get involved in, how, how to help the team, and just kind of finding what's needed and doing that. So understanding your manager, this is again understanding what's driving them, what keeps them up, up at night, what is really important for them, and how you can align what you're doing to their goals. Strengths and weaknesses also applies here. So just because they're your manager, they're still going to have weaknesses. Um, and this is quite important because you can realize where you can learn from them and where you can support them at areas that maybe they're not as good at. And you need to help them understand you. So how you can support them is actually by helping them understand what you're doing in your role. So some of us might have managers who are in UX, but probably a lot of people won't. Um, and so a lot of people still, unfortunately, need to be educated about what UX is and why we do it and how we do it and, and the value that it brings. So being in that role, it's really important to also make sure that they understand who you are and the value you bring and what you can do. And of course, working with stakeholders and understanding them. So again, we've all worked with stakeholders, but as a manager, the relationship changes a little bit. It is, um, it's, you have more responsibility towards them, probably they have higher expectations of you, and maybe you need to do certain things that you didn't have to before. So having to help resolve disagreements on a design direction. They also might not be as familiar with UX as you, so there's some amount of helping them understand what it is and how it can support their goals. So again, by understanding them and knowing what's driving them, that can help you sort of sell and get them to buy into wanting to work with you and wanting to use UX kind of in its most valuable way rather than just kind of a little bit of an add-on at the end. One thing that I've learned kind of working with stakeholders um, is that it is really important to respect the design opinion of people who are not designers. 
So even when they're product managers or developers, um, and I feel that they don't necessarily have the same expertise and maybe don't always know what they're talking about, um, I think it's still really important to understand why they think what they think. Because once you understand it, you can kind of work better at coming to a solution or a compromise together. And sometimes you just have to let things go. <laughs> so let them have a win and then hopefully the next time around you'll have a win as well when it really matters. Another principle of design that applies also to, to management and leadership is understanding the context. So just like when we're designing, we need to know if we're designing on the web or on a mobile device, on Android or iOS, and what our users are doing when they're trying to um, complete the task. Equally, we have to understand the context that we're working in. So you need to know things like what's the environment, um, what are the challenges, and, and the things that you do in the way you approach problems are going to depend on that. So I think coming to events like these and hearing about how other designers have solved certain problems in their areas is really valuable. But at the same time, you always have to keep in mind your particular context. And that, your, your other responsibility now as a manager, of course you need to understand that before as well, but your additional responsibility is to translate that back to your team. And understand where UX fits into everything. So is UX an important part, an established part of the company or not? And if it's not, then the way you go about doing it is probably going to be different than if it was. And of course, as designers, we design, we create solutions, we problem solve. Um, and this is, again, what I feel that I do as a manager, but instead of designing a product or a piece of software, what I'm designing is the conditions, uh, the culture and the processes in order for my team to do their job the best way that they can. So, you know, taking the, the other points previously, understanding your team and your manager, the stakeholders, the context that you're working in, when you kind of bring that all together, you can then design solutions that will get the best out of your team, that will help you kind of reach shared goals together. And also, kind of being aware of what are the problems, so you can't design a solution if you don't really know what the issues are. So that's kind of the other piece of, of what we do, is really understanding the problem, where are the barriers, where are things going wrong, and finding ways to design processes and cultures that will that can work around it and, and resolve those issues. And of course, we never stop learning. We iterate, we refine, we kind of keep trying new things in order to get to the best design. And the same thing goes as a manager. You're never done, your culture is never completely done, the processes, the way you approach problems or design solutions is never done and there's always kind of more ways to improve and especially because companies change all the time so you're never done there'll be organizational change or there's changes in the industry there's always disruption so we always have to kind of think about how that then changes our situation and what we can do to improve things where we work so these to kind of summarize my first lesson were four design principles that really helped me once I realized that I can apply these things to a new context. So it made kind of being a manager and being a leader of a team feel more familiar to me because it was doing things that I already know how to do even though they were still new. So just to make that maybe a little bit more tangible, um, to give you an example, one of the problems that we face on our team is that we are a relatively small team compared to the number of developers that we have in the organization. So with such a large team of developers, they're able to create and build a lot more than we can actually design for. So one thing that we have to do is think about how we prioritize. So what are the things we're going to work on and which are the things we're just going to let slide. So this we use kind of all these principles to come up with the best way of approaching this problem. So understanding the team, you need to know if you've actually got the people to do the, the jobs or the projects that are being asked. You need to understand your manager and their goals are, is what you're doing with taking on this piece of work in alignment with their goals and the goals of the business as a whole. Um, are you aligned with your stakeholders? So sometimes we get into problems where 
we're working on a project or a piece of work where our goals are different to the goals of our stakeholders. Like maybe they're really keen to get something out quickly and they just want you know, a little bit of help to do a bit of spit and polish at the end, whereas what we want to do is create a really great experience and take the time to make that quality. So by understanding what their goals are, we can see whether or not we actually align, and in some cases we don't, it's better to just kind of let it go. And then our solution, so our solution to this particular problem is to think about those things that I mentioned. Do we have the right people? Do we have the goals? in alignment with business goals and stakeholder goals, and is this work that we feel is valuable to take on. And we iterate and we refine. So in the past, we've decided how to prioritize work in different ways. We've tried to cover more in kind of more light touch approaches, whereas now we try to say no to more things and really focus on the pieces of work that we think will deliver the most value. And for me, I think the most important thing in, in all of this, um, when designing for teams and cultures and processes, is persistence and not expecting things to happen quickly. Because it's not like when you're designing a UI and you can get it built pretty quickly and test it in front of users, that the decisions you make take more time to see kind of how they play out and to see whether it was the right decision or not. So I think what matters is finding a way to track if you are actually having the impact that you want. So in my example, um, how we measure whether we're choosing the right things to prioritize is whether how much of what we work on actually makes it into the end product. So we've had a lot of experiences in the past where we'll do a large piece of work and then in the end the stakeholders decide, well, they don't want to do it for whatever reason. So if we make stuff that gets into the product as we've designed it and gets used by end users at the end, then I think we're doing a really good job and we can feel like we know how to prioritize and we're working on the right things. Okay, so my second lesson is about what really matters in leadership. So I had an image of what a leader was. Um, we probably all have some subconscious biases based on culture, or media, things like that. This is what you get uh, if you do a Google search for a great leader. <laughs> These are the kinds of faces that come up. Um, and it's quite an intimidating bunch. <laughs> um, so I guess my own biases about leadership were people who were charismatic and outgoing and charming and brilliant and, and all of those things. And for me, that was quite intimidating. So what I did was I kind of kept reading and I wanted to know what, what is it really that makes a great leader. And as I kind of dug into it a little bit deeper, what I realized was it wasn't what I thought it was. There are certain characteristics and there are certain, maybe not characteristics, there are certain themes about what matters, but they're not about being charismatic. So one of the books I read when I was kind of going into this um, was this book published by the Harvard Business Review. It's a collection of 10 articles about the best articles on leadership. And one of them in there was written by Daniel Goleman and it's called What Makes a Leader. So he also wrote the book Emotional Intelligence. Heard of that? So he talks about, in this article, the importance of emotional intelligence in leadership. So he, what he found in his research is that the greatest predictor of success is not IQ and it's not technical skills, but it's actually emotional intelligence. So of course, those things do matter. You do need to have a certain threshold level of IQ and technical skills, but after that level, actually the difference between say a star performer and an average performer is in their emotional intelligence. He found that nearly 90% of the difference was due to emotional intelligence rather than cognitive abilities. And he said that as you kind of continue to go up into higher roles in the company, it becomes even more profound. So you've probably heard of emotional intelligence, but I'm going to give you a bit of a definition. So emotional intelligence includes abilities like being able to motivate yourself, and persist in the face of frustrations, control impulse and delay gratification, 
regulate your mood and keep distress from swamping your ability to think and to empathize and to hope. So the way I think of, think of emotional intelligence is about how you respond to different and often very difficult situations. So these are kind of a list of things that will happen to all of us, um, it certainly happened to me, and how you handle them um, kind of depends on your emotional intelligence. So for example, with a bitter disagreement, say on the direction of a design or some other aspect of, of your working life, if instead of kind of writing them off, um, if you can have empathy for their point of view and kind of understand that actually this person has a reason for thinking what they think, even if it seems outrageous to you. When you encounter harsh criticism, and this, for me anyway, happened more as a manager than it did before, <laughs> so how can you learn from that? Even if you feel it, it's unjustified, um, even if you don't, if you think that person's got something against you which has nothing to do with, with you, there's still probably something that you can learn there. If you're in a difficult situation, rather than kind of trying to get away from it, running from it, rising to the challenge and kind of taking it head on. Or if a project goes wrong, as some do inevitably, being able to take responsibility. So even if it's not your fault, kind of trying to find the areas where you could have made a difference and learning from that for next time. So Daniel Goleman lists five components of emotional intelligence. And the first one is self-awareness. And self-awareness is about knowing your strengths and weaknesses, and also understanding your moods and your drives and how you affect other people. So my example about self-awareness, or perhaps my lack of self-awareness, was when I first became a manager. Um, and I didn't really know how to do it, <laughs> so I tried to be like my manager. And my manager is very different to me. He had a quite strong, forceful personality, could be quite aggressive at times, um, and sort of told people what to do and expected it to get done. So when I tried that, it didn't work very well. <laughs> um, I ended up alienating some of the people on my team and kind of overall just didn't have the effect that I wanted. So that might seem like a bit of an obvious example, but at the same time, I do believe it is hard to know yourself. You can't, know, you can't see yourself the way other people see you. So there's always kind of more that you can learn about who you are and use that to be more effective as an individual and as a manager. The other point about self-awareness is knowing that you do affect the people around you. And as a manager, you cast a bigger shadow because now you have your team who kind of you have responsibility towards and you can affect their working lives. The second element is about self-regulation. So this is about how you control or redirect impulses and moods. And um, I think of this as kind of knowing in your head what's the right thing to do, but it's actually much harder to do it. So we all have default behaviors, especially if we're feeling threatened or feeling insecure or angry. Um, and the point of self-regulation is trying to do something that's against your default behavior and doing something more productive instead. My default behavior is to retreat. I try to avoid the problem. I want to avoid the person who's causing me my problems. Um, but of course, that's not going to lead to any kind of resolution. So not very productive. In some cases, um, you might have to swallow your pride or acknowledge that you were wrong or face some kind of uncomfortable emotion and deal with it. But I think with self-regulation, it's not just about willpower. It's not just about saying, okay, I'm gonna be different now. I think it's really about learning to acknowledge your own feelings and knowing that it's okay to feel angry or to feel hurt or to feel jealous or whatever kind of emotions come up um, in our working lives because we all feel that way sometimes. And once you can accept kind of your feeling and feeling that way, then I think you can respond more productively. So the next point is about motivation. And this is about being able to pursue your goals with energy and persistence. So I think we all have our own challenges at work. Um, 
<coughs> projects that don't go our way or frustrating experiences. Um, and, and it can be hard to stay motivated. I think one that I sometimes struggle with, and, and I know the people on my team, because we like to complain about this together, um, is the fact that the, the company or the people around us don't understand UX. Um, they don't value it, they, we get overlooked, we don't get kind of the credit we deserve. Um, but instead of sort of just saying, okay, well that's how it is, or finding another job, um, motivation is about knowing that you want to get somewhere, you want to have UX, have a place in the company, and continually working towards that. So this is a TED talk, it's just a short one, but I'm going to play a short clip of it, um, by Angela Lee Duckworth, and her talk is called The Key to Success is Grit. So this very much mirrors the point about motivation, she calls it grit, um, and she says it's passion and perseverance in the long term. So I'm just going to play this clip. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study, my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling Bee and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods asking which teachers are still going to be here in teaching by the end of the school year. And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students? We partnered with private companies asking which of these salespeople is going to keep their jobs? And who's going to earn the most money? In all those very different contexts, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence, it wasn't good looks, physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking with your future, day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon not a sprint. So I think, you know, I really like what she says, that it's not days, it's not weeks, it's not even months, it's about years. So thinking about the really long term and having the persistence and the motivation to kind of keep working at it. So the fourth aspect of um, emotional intelligence is empathy. And empathy is something I mentioned before as one of the skills that we kind of learn as UX people. But I think there is a difference between being empathetic to your users and being empathetic to the people around you who are really making your life a bit of a living hell. Um, so it's much harder to be empathetic when you're stressed, when you're annoyed, if you're not getting what you want. It's easier to blame the other person or find fault with them rather than actually seeing it from their point of view and, and empathizing. But at the same time, I think it is the most important thing in order to kind of move beyond disagreements and un really understand people's point of view. So I had you know, times when working with my team, I didn't have the results that I expected and didn't necessarily want to hear or didn't hear kind of <coughs> where it had gone wrong or when it had gone wrong. Um, but I think it was only kind of in hindsight and after the situation had passed that I realized actually they had a very different perspective than what I did. And to them, you know, there was something that was missing. Maybe I didn't give enough direction or didn't support them where it was needed. There were things that I could have done differently that would have resulted in a different outcome. And if I had been more empathetic at the time, perhaps I could have seen it then, but I'm trying to learn for the future. <clears throat> And the last element is social skills. So this is about managing relationships, building your networks, finding common ground, etc. So if you want to get something done, then of course social skills matter. We, none of us work in silos. We all depend on other people to get things done. So if we want to get a design implemented, we need the buy-in from our stakeholders, from the product managers. We need the developers to build it as we designed it. 
So this one I personally find quite difficult. <laughs> I'm um, an introvert, I can be quite a quiet person. I would rather keep to myself than necessarily go out there and meet a lot of people and build relationships. So this is one that I perhaps don't have a lot of experience at, um, but I'll just tell you what helped me. So for me, it was trying to shift my perspective. So rather than you know, meeting somebody else and worrying about what are they thinking of me or um, what, what are their kind of complaints about working with me or you know, what are the issues, trying to focus a little bit more on them and really understanding who they are, understanding what their point of view is and then kind of building relationships that way. So in time, this has kind of helped to make it a little bit more natural and a little bit more enjoyable. So emotional intelligence, these, some of the things that I talked about today are probably not completely new to you. Um, and they might even sound trivial, but I hope they don't. Because I think that they are really important. Um, but I think that, and, and what I've learned kind of thinking about it and my own experience and reflecting is that there's a level of depth to them that I hadn't quite realized. So just, it, it's a skill and just like design is a skill, you can never be finished. You can always improve and get better and improve your emotional intelligence. But the great thing about emotional intelligence is that like a skill, it can be learned. Um, but it's learned differently. So you don't learn it through your analytical mind, you learn it through your limbic system. So that learns through practice rather than by knowing. So these things are easy to know, not necessarily easy to do, and that's because the way you learn them is through practice. So firstly, you need motivation. You have to want to change, you have to want to do something differently. Secondly, you need to practice and kind of keep working at it, having that motivation that I talked about, and getting feedback. So knowing when it is going the way that you wanted and when it's not. So this helps by getting kind of people around you, 360 feedback, things like that, to see if you are actually improving and moving the way that you want to be moving. So, you know, to summarize my second lesson, I realized that I didn't need to be someone that I wasn't. I didn't need to be different. Um, what actually matters with, in leadership can be improved with time and effort. So you can all improve at becoming a better leader. You don't need to be Steve Jobs in order to be a leader. Um, it's more about being yourself, but being yourself to your fullest potential. It's not easy to do. It does take time and practice and effort, but I believe it's a really worthwhile thing to do because it helps not just at work, but in all areas of life. My third lesson, um, and possibly the one that's kind of made the most impact for me, is learning how to give myself a break. So, you know, kind of having gone through everything that's required to be a manager, and this is only just kind of one level of it, um, it requires a lot of skills, a lot of different abilities, um, and it's not something that you can learn sort of reading one book and just be good at it. And I tend to wonder sometimes if I'm finding something difficult, if Maybe I'm just not meant to do that. So, um, you know, if, if I was meant to be a manager, then it should be effortless and I'd be amazing at it, but it didn't quite work out that way. So this comic um, kind of, maybe some of you can relate to it, I'll read it. Uh, it's a therapist sitting on the couch saying, your fear of being publicly exposed as a fraud is a stress-related disorder called imposter syndrome. It's common among people in high-profile authority positions and, of course, in actual phonies, like you. So, imposter syndrome, this is certainly something I experienced and something I continue to experience, although less than when I started. So when I started and I was head of visual design and I had no visual design background, um, I felt that I didn't deserve to have be in the position that I was in. And even when I was doing well at it and became successful and obviously continued to kind of grow, I still felt that I didn't deserve it. And that's basically what imposter syndrome is, feeling that you don't deserve to be where you are, that maybe it was due to luck or some kind of mistake. And what's interesting and perhaps a bit ironic about it is that it's common amongst high-achieving people. Um, 
people who are really successful. And there have been successful, famous people who've talked about it publicly. People like Sheryl Sandberg, COO of Facebook, and Emma Watson. So obviously very successful people who have great talent and deserve to be where they are, but can still feel and suffer from imposter syndrome. So this, I kind of like this diagram. Um, on the left is sort of how, what you might feel. So what you know is a small subset compared to everybody else. But in reality, you actually probably know similar amounts to other people. It's just different things. So they overlap, but they're not the same. And that can lead to a feeling of not knowing as much as other people, but actually it's just different. So part of giving myself a break was realizing that actually a lot of people feel this way some of the time, um, and it has a name, <laughs> so it's a legit thing. So you might feel as though you're faking it, but actually the way to get over it is to realize that everybody is to some extent, um, and that by accepting it and being able to talk about it kind of helps lessen that feeling. So this is another TED Talk, I'm not going to play this one, um, but I really like it, so I had to add it. Um, this is by Amy Cuddy, and her talk is Your Body Language Shapes Who You Are. This is actually the second most viewed TED Talk, so probably some of you have seen it. Um, and basically her premise is about <coughs> how acting in a certain way, holding yourself in a way, in a certain way, your body language can actually make you feel different. It affects... Um, testosterone levels and cortisol levels in your brain and can actually make you feel more confident. So standing in what she calls power positions, so or power poses, poses which kind of make you seem bigger and are kind of poses of confidence that can actually make you feel more confident. And what she says that kind of relates to imposter syndrome and what she talks about her own imposter syndrome in the talk, she says that you fake it until you become it. So over time, by kind of continuing to fake it and doing the things that you're maybe afraid to do or don't yet feel qualified to do, eventually you do those things enough and you realize actually you do feel qualified and you do feel like you deserve to be there and to be doing what you're doing. Another thing that helped me was to realize that anyone can be a leader and this sort of um, repeats a little bit what I was saying before. And it's not to say that everyone can or should be a leader. It's a very individual thing, but anyone can be a leader in that there's no specific style or characteristic um, or skill or style in order to be a leader. You can be whoever you are and still be a really effective leader. So in this article called Discovering Your Authentic Leadership, which was in the same book, um, these four authors did some research. And what they did was they talked to 125 leaders. These are people from many different backgrounds, different ages, different races, socioeconomic statuses. Um, but the, the thing that they had in common was that they were all known to be exceptional leaders. About half of them in the study were CEOs. And what they found after going through quite in-depth interviews and um, shadowing and things like that with these people was that there was not a single common characteristic or trait or skill or style that led to their success. And they kind of go on to say that they, they've looked through over a thousand studies because there's been quite a lot of studies, people trying to determine what makes an effective leader, and that they found that there's not a profile of an ideal leader. What they found through interviewing these 125 people was that actually what made them successful and effective was their drive to understand themselves and the purpose of their leadership, not about <coughs> any particular aspect of it. So I think that this is really powerful because it's actually, the message is that it's only by being yourself and understanding who you are and, and why you want to do what you do that you can be a really successful and effective leader. So another perspective on this is In the Book of Quiet by Susan Cain. Um, so this is a book about introverts, and if you haven't read it, I recommend it. It's a very good book. Um, and to, if you don't know what an introvert is, you're probably familiar with the term. I will vastly simplify it. Um, introverts are people who tend to keep to themselves a little bit more. 
a little bit quieter rather than being kind of more outgoing and social. Um, but what the book is about is that our culture, and especially Western culture, is that being an extrovert is a way you need to be. And, and, it's, and especially when talking about leadership, um, that is kind of the, the stereotypical image of a leader, somebody who's quite outgoing, very social, maybe a bit forceful or even a bit aggressive. That's what you need. But what she says is actually that you need to stick to your own guns, you know, do things your own way, and that is what helps you be successful. So I'm going to read this quote. She says, so stay true to your own nature. If you like to do things in a slow and steady way, don't let others make you feel as if you have to race. If you enjoy depth, don't force yourself to seek breadth. If you prefer single tasking to multitasking, stick to your guns. Being relatively unmoved by rewards gives you the incalculable power to go your own way. So this applies to anything. This is not really just about being a leader, but it's about being true to yourself. So whether that's being true to yourself as a leader or being true to yourself and realizing actually you don't want to be a leader, this advice is really valid. So another thing that helped me was um, not focusing so much on external things and rather doing things for the sake of doing them. And this is what uh, this is what the author talks about in his book Flow. And I can never remember how to pronounce his name, even though I've been told many times. Um, and he talks about the state called flow, which is this optimal state when you're totally engaged in what you're doing, and you're not doing it for any external reason. You're not doing it for the rewards or how you look or anything like that. It's just you're completely engaged in the activity, and you're doing the activity for its own sake. And this is sort of what helped me when I stopped focusing on how I look to other people or how I'm performing or what's my next career move or what I'm going to do and just focused on doing the job and doing it as well as I can for the own like reward of doing a good job. And this is my last point in the section and it's for me it's a, it's a really important one. Because with the things that I talked about before, um, you know, having the courage to be yourself and to be authentic and having the patience to develop emotional intelligence and continuing to have motivation and believing in yourself, I think the first thing, the thing that comes first is the ability to be kind to yourself. So it's very hard if you're berating yourself or criticizing yourself to have the courage to do these things. It's much easier when you're kind of supportive and you believe in yourself. So this is like emotional intelligence, not something you can just learn and know and do. Um, if, it, if you do tend to be someone who gives yourself a hard time, then it's done through practice. It's about kind of recognizing those times when you are being critical and realizing that that's not the most effective way to go about it. It's actually much better to be positive. So when I was creating this presentation originally for the conference, um, it was pretty intimidating. I'd never done a talk this long before. I'd never presented at a big conference like that. Um, and I had quite a critical voice in my head saying that this talk wasn't going to be any good and why did I sign up for it in the first place and <laughs> what have I got myself into? Um, and, and when that's going on, it's very hard to work on creating a great presentation. So it's really only when I was sort of able to quiet that voice that I managed to make a bit of progress and ended up really enjoying making this presentation because there are things that are very kind of close to me and what I believe in. The other point that I just wanted to add about kind of being compassionate with yourself and something that I learned along the way is that if you're more compassionate to yourself, you could be more compassionate to other people as well. And I think that the world would be a better place if we're all a bit more compassionate to each other. And this quote by Maya Angelou, I think it summarizes the sentiment well. She says, I did then what I knew how to do, and when I knew better, I did better. So this is, I think, what it means to be kind to yourself, just about accepting where you are at this moment and knowing that you're doing the best that you can. It's not about kind of being complacent and saying, well, you're never going to improve. It's just accepting where you are today and knowing that when you can do better, you will. 
So this is kind of in summary of my third lesson, a progress, a work in progress for me, learning how to give myself a break. Um, and it's not that I don't now have frustrating or challenging situations anymore. I still have all of those things, but it becomes easier to deal with because I'm not giving myself a hard time about it. And I'm learning that actually um, it's easier and more enjoyable when I'm not putting that pressure on myself. So as a result, I've been sort of struggling a little bit less, and it's not so much kind of a fear of failure that might be driving me, but more about you know, my own desire to achieve and to do good, a good job for its own sake. So just to kind of wrap up, um, when I took the job to be head of visual design, I thought it was just sort of the thing to do. It's the next step in a career, that's what you do, you become a manager. And, you know, if I'm being really honest, I probably also did it for things like status, for money. Uh, status is probably the bigger thing for me. I, I had this idea, somewhat subconsciously, but maybe a bit conscious, that, you know, the higher up you are, the more important you are, and you more value as a person. And of course, that's not true, but that is kind of a message that we get from society. So if I look back, you know, I don't think those were good roles to take, good reasons to take the role. There is other ways that you can um, get money and status if that's what you want, although they're also not necessarily the things that bring the most happiness. And there are other ways to progress your career where you can have really meaningful and challenging work that doesn't involve being a manager. So why would you become a UX manager? <laughs> well, if you are interested in, doing, in that design challenge of leading and managing a UX team, so like I said, it is a challenge and it does have, use a lot of different skills to get it right. It's not easy. Um, if you want to have a bigger impact than maybe you could as an individual by being a manager and a leader, you have kind of more ability to, to have an impact through your team. And if you want the opportunity and responsibility of helping people in their careers. So we all know that we spend, you know, probably most of our waking life at work. And by having a good work environment, you're actually helping people and, and contributing to people's kind of wellness. So these are the reasons I think one should become a UX manager. And luckily for me, even though when I first took the role, I didn't have good reasons for doing it, these do hold true for me. And so I have really enjoyed being a UX manager. These are the things that really matter and not what I thought. Thank you. These are some of the things that are referred to in my talk today.